Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for making to Healthcare Analytics. Uh, quick question before we begin. Uh, how many folks are actually in the healthcare space? Raise show hands. Oh, cool. Very cool. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ari Mayer. I'm a product manager in Google Cloud. And today we're going to have an exciting lineup of speakers for you. So Google's mission is to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. I would like to maybe provide a framework for you to think about today's content in an organized way so it will help you organize information inside your head. So we're going to have several case studies and we have customers are going to be talking about how they use analytics and how they use our tools to solve some of the challenges in their clinical workflows and their operational workflows. So we're going to talk about how um, NLP can help trauma surgeons provide better patient care. What do smart hospital rooms and patient shuttles have in common? And how does clinical data where has power a health data compass? So our goal today is not to impress you, but to impress upon you that analytics really is a wide umbrella of tools. And it really depends what is the problem you're trying to solve for and what's the right tool for it. And please, our goal is also to enable you to build your applications. So come talk to us after this talk, find us in our booth. We want to work together with you to help you solve the challenges you see in your day every day. So I'm going to pass the mic to Dr. Gabriel Brad to talk about trauma surgery. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming today. Today I'm going to talk about Trauma Map. Trauma Map is a collaboration between Google, Life Image, and my surgical informatics group at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. We are developing a tool to allow for rapid summarization of traumatic injuries uh, that can be provided to trauma surgeons and emergency medicine providers and can then be associated with uh, potential injuries that might be related to that specific uh, injury set. Our vision is to leverage NLP methodologies such as uh, um, uh, uh, identity management and uh, a trauma graph that is derived from hundreds of thousands of radiological images and trauma registry information. Fundamentally, the idea is to create a tool that can be delivered at the point of care and then can assist with clinical management throughout the patient journey. This is particularly possible because trauma is unique in its characteristics and at the same time, we have an association with life manager, life image as a data broker. So let me talk to you a little bit about this, why this is so valuable. Specifically, trauma is one of the major causes of death in the world. It is the major cause of mortality for those less than 45 years of age. And because of the explosion in the number of patients over the age of 65, there are more than 3 million patients who present to an emergency department with traumatic injuries. My job as a trauma surgeon is to rapidly evaluate those patients and to identify what injuries they have. These are patients who fall, patients who are in car accidents, patients who are uh, shot or stabbed and then present to my emergency department. What I have to do is rapidly take in all the information that is available to me and better decide whether they need to go to surgery for further imaging or to continue their medical management. As a result, this leads to a unique situation that translates into two characteristics that allow for automated clinical analytics. The first is that injury patterns are consistent. Because of the situations that exist by mechanism, a patient can present with an injury pattern that is relatively and associated with other injuries. This consistency leads us to have the ability to generate a correlation matrix for that specific uh, patient population across hundreds of thousands of trainings and trauma registry uh, data sets. At the same time, 
This also allows us to provide uh, clinical decision support because these patients, as they present, uh, have an association that we can then represent to the providers for those patients. And this assists with the NLP problem because this is a generally restricted vocabulary that exists for these patients. Second, 20 to 50 percent of patients who uh, undergo trauma in the United States are actually transferred to another trauma center. And we all know about the incredible difficulties that exist and the failures that exist in managing the communication between providers and be uh, at a uh, unique center. Now compound that where you're trying to transfer patients from one healthcare system to another and you're trying to actually pass on that information. This leads to a situation that is potentially life-threatening uh, and very dangerous. And so what we're hoping to do is to create a situation that actually glues the findings that are uh, attained at an outside hospital with the providers who are receiving these patients. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in detail. So let's take a patient who's had a fall. As we talked about, patients uh, sustain multiple injuries. So this patient has a scapular injury, they have a rib fracture, and they have a left hip fracture. And we as trauma surgeons know that there's an association between injury patterns and other injuries. And so for example, if you look at a rib fracture, we know that based on where the rib fracture is, that's associated with injury to the chest or to the abdomen. And so for example, in this patient who has a left lower rib fracture, in this uh, association of injuries, this patient has a 17% chance of having a splenic laceration. Over millions of uh, radiographs and uh, trauma registry data, we can then build a trauma graph that allows us to understand the relationship between all of these injuries and all of the potential injuries that a patient may have. What's beautiful is then we can put that directly into the existing workflow that in trauma. When a patient is injured, they go from the field to a nearby hospital. At that hospital, they receive multiple imaging modalities. In this case, this patient got a x-ray of the shoulder, they had a CAT scan of their chest and a CAT scan of their head, and from that, a group of radiologists then cr create a group of uh, uh, radiology reports that describe these injuries. Now, this is where our technology kicks in, because at this point, we can take this information combine it with the data that exists in the trauma graph and create an injury list and its associated injuries. So this patient is then transferred to a trauma center where I see them, I evaluate them at the point of care, I have access to this injury list and the ap uh, appropriate associated injuries, and this gives me the ability to better do injury tracking for that patient, to think about how to continue medical management or to decide whether that patient needs further imaging given the information that I have. And as an adjunct, the other fact that as we have this persistent list of, in, of, of injuries, this also allows us to better consider how to discharge these patients because as we know right now, greater than 50% of patients with incidental findings are actually discharged without any uh, description of that finding in their discharge paperwork. So I'm going to pass the microphone on to Janik Joshi, who will talk a little bit more about what that interface would look like. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer at Life Image. Um, so Beth Israel Deaconess, Jefferson Memorial are both Life Image customers. And there are two of 1,500 plus hospitals that Life Image actively manages for um, data transfers when patients are uh, needed care coordination, referral management, secondary reads, trauma surgeries, stroke patients, et cetera. So in tr when, you think, when you think about referrals, um, sorry, I think I pressed the wrong button. Yeah, there we go. Um, so what you see here is the interface that radiologists, trauma surgeons like Gabriel actually see in front of them. And what you're seeing is a single patient chart context. And inside that patient chart, we can identify uh, from the radiology report, how many abnormal readings are indicated? And what are the likely associations with it? This particular piece of injury graph actually has the potential to significantly accelerate and improve the outcomes 
because of the speed with which the trauma surgeons are able to provide the intervention. So instead of spending 10 minutes or 20 minutes or completely missing the injury itself, now you actually know that if you have a lower left uh, rib fracture, then you have a potential for a spleen laceration. So I just wanted to speak to it because I received a lot of questions around, well, where is this information going to be displayed? Is this going to be an API? Who's going to actually use it and across what point in the workflow? And this is a classic example that we are piloting both with Google and with multiple institutions saying, how about we try to life image first? Because life image at the end of the day is a network. And, all, and everything that Gabriel was talking about is aggregating millions of records or millions of images from multiple institutions that want to participate in something like this uh, is actually, a, so it, it's possible when you have a network. So think of life image as kind of a conduit for delivering uh, the end result on which the action is gonna be taken. That's not to say that the result that you see on the screen here is gonna be restricted just to life image. Um, you can show the same thing in your PAC system, in your EHR, or whatever homegrown system that you might have to improve the workflow. But in order to establish the art of the possible, I think this is critical path, not just for trauma surgery, but for a variety of other therapeutic areas, both in the provider space as well as in the pharma space. So let me hand off the uh, mic to Neil Gomes. Uh, Neil is the Chief uh, Innovation Officer at Jefferson Memorial and one of our customers. Thank you. Thanks, Janik. And um, I'm here representing Jefferson and our team called the DICE Group, or the Digital Innovation and Consumer Experience Group. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming here. The, um, a few stats about our university and health system. Uh, we have about 15 hospitals. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, about 15 hospitals, um, uh, you know, $5.2 billion in revenue. We are mostly in the Philadelphia area, but also extending out into New Jersey and, uh, uh, and surrounding areas. And uh, Jefferson's an institution that's been around for about um, 200 years now almost. So one of the first few medical schools in the nation um, and uh, very well known across uh, in medical circles. But our biggest, our best numbers really are, and ones that are near and dear to us and our team, are the patient encounters we have, you know, over 3.2 million outpatient encounters a year, about 120,000 admissions to our hospitals a year, and about 405,000 ED visits. Uh, so our patients matter a lot to us, of course, so, so do our students and our staff. And so when we create solutions, uh, we try to create them focused on the consumer first. So a little bit about the ethos of our team. Um, we, our, our motto is to bring digital to life, and we understand that we can't really do that nowadays just sitting in our own cubes and, and doing it on our own, right? We need to use platforms like Google Cloud uh, to make these things happen, use services that are provided by these companies that have great investment um, into very creative solutions that we can put together and bring about a solution for our patients or our students. So that's what we do. Uh, you know, we track uh, innovations in other industries also, and we see that the companies that focus on the consumer, you know, ardently, and uh, that then leverage digital platforms do really well, and they transform their industries over time. So that's what we are trying to do here. And with Google, we found a great partner in doing it. So what do we do? Well, we're just going to show you a couple of examples here, but uh, uh, we, as, as we focus so much on the consumer and our patient in this case, uh, uh, we decided to create an uh, in-patient room experience for the patient where they can control not just, uh, you know, or just ask questions of this personal assistant via voice, but also control the environment. So we went uh, the whole hog and started connecting to our billing automation systems, um, we use Siemens, uh, Johnson Controls in some places, uh, so that they can, the patient can change the temperature, can uh, change the lighting in a room. Uh, we also connect to devices that are in the room and allow them to change the channels on a TV, play a orientation video, play a discharge video, uh, get discharge instructions about their patient. And, and, and it's st still also valuable to the institution, apart from the great experience it provides. It also enables uh, the institution to save time from clinicians, uh, you know, who normally are the people answering these questions about when's my next meal coming, you know, when are the visiting hours, and, uh, you know, turn up the heat, or those types of things in the room. Uh, and we've also taken these technologies 
created an IoT platform, created APIs behind some of the other services we offer on the web and connected them using uh, Google Dialogflow and other, other such APIs on the Google Cloud Platform to create a consolidated service that a, that a consumer can access, the patient can access in this case very easily just using voice. Um, Rob's gonna talk to you, Rob is our VP for um, for development, application development. Uh, I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Jefferson and Rob works on my, on my team. He's gonna talk to you about the architecture of the solution and also introduce another solution to you. Great, thank you, Neil. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, so yes, uh, pleased to be here and pleased to just give a little bit of background about technically how we accomplish uh, the in-room patient concierge that Neil just mentioned. Also how we accomplish some other solutions that we've developed by partnering with uh, APIs on Google Cloud um, and other services. So um, in the case of the patient-focused digital cognitive concierge, and I realize that's a mouthful, we're working on it, um, we have the Jefferson environment, which is broken up into pieces that live in the patient room. Uh, so the patient environment, the speaker, the agents, the things that the patient is interacting in with their room. Um, and then we have the Jefferson Cognitive Assistant, which runs as uh, a, a suite of different solutions that run at Jefferson, communicating back with a number of different services in the Google Cloud. So I'm gonna run you real quickly through how this all works. Um, in step one, we've got a patient talking or listening to some sort of device in the room, sending that request um, out using the Google Speech API to get it translated into text, get it processed via dialogue flow, sending that back to a fulfillment library that we've put together, which we figure out how to fulfill the request based on the intents that we heard. Uh, we then send that over through the Jiot platform, which we've developed to process that request and figure out, does it need to terminate back in a speech endpoint or one of those agents for the patient? Does it need to terminate um, back controlling one of those things? And then finally send some sort of response back to, the, uh, to Google or to a speech API to get translated uh, back in the speech and played back to the patient. So just one uh, very quick example and wanted to run through how we're using uh, Google Cloud Platform APIs, a number of them in this one uh, specific use case, but we use Google um, APIs and, and lots of services across many of the different solutions that we've built. As Neil said earlier, it would be impossible and it wouldn't make sense for us to build our own API in every single case. We want to leverage and work with the best partners when we can to string together a number of different solutions to build uh, things that make life better and easier for the doctors and patients that come to Jefferson. So another example, and what do patient shuttles have to do with this? We realized actually uh, when one of our own employees was injured uh, in a, a biking accident that um, just getting around the Jefferson campus was quite complicated. We did have a patient shuttle and we have stops where it stopped, uh, but it was never clear how long it would take the shuttle to make a loop or where it was, um, or if it was even on the route. So we started doing some digging um, and it turned out there was a uh, way that we could track this information via an API, um, but simply figuring out where the shuttle was while that was cool wasn't really uh, gonna necessarily give the patient the information they needed, like how long would it take for the shuttle to get to the next stop? Where was the closest stop? So we looked at what APIs were available in Google Cloud in the area of maps and traffic and uh, distance calculation, and we actually have a real-time map now at shuttle.jefferson.edu you can visit that site. It figures out based on uh, your phone, potentially if you have GPS turned on, it'll ask you to turn on, figures out the closest stop to you. In this case, it figures out the closest stop is the 1100 Walnut Street stop. Um, and you can see it's marked their closest and goes out in real time, queries the exact location of the shuttle, uses Google traffic APIs to based on traffic, based on accidents, based on other information that's going on, calculates the time it should take the shuttle to get you to that stop. Uh, so really looking at how can we leverage technologies from Google uh, to optimize the experience for patients um, and doctors across the system. These are two fairly diverse cases, and obviously we're, we're looking at life image and we're looking at other partners that we have, how we can optimize the process um, for physicians and providers using clinical uh, technologies um, and make that better using Google APIs and Google Cloud. So, folks, you have seen several very different use cases uh, in different level of uh, different stage of development. So, as you can imagine, and as you've seen here, the depends on the problem you're trying to solve. There are different tools and approaches. So, I'm not going to turn this into a presentation of all the tools that we have. We have lots of them, but I do want to uh, present like one tool very briefly because this is uh, very often a 
good starting point for anyone interested in analytics at large. You know, we've all heard the term big data, like even bigger data, the data number multiplies every number of years. Um, and I'll give you a use case where this tool becomes very relevant. So this is a specific example. In most hospitals, if you try to, let's say, optimize a screening protocol for breast cancer, so you might be interested to find all female patients of a certain age bracket that have a family history of breast cancer with specific biomarker that indicates an increased risk that haven't been screened in the last 24 months. And you want to send invitation for screening for these particular patients. Now, today, this use case, this query, this multimodality query, I call it multimodality because it uses data of different types. It's almost impossible to run. So the reason for that is, is Twofold. Number one is the data is often spread across different silos. So, for example, your radiology information system, your risk contains when was this patient screened last, even if they even were screened in your facility. Or the demographics data might be in the EHR, and these two systems might not be connected with each other. The other reason for the, why this is difficult is because the data is not always structured. So some of this data might be in a radiology report, which are, can be handwritten and scanned, or can be text, but it's not structured, it's not a relational, uh, it's not a database. So once we bring the data, let's say, to something like BigQuery, then you know the, the, the technical folks become very interested because then you can run SQL queries on this, then you have all these interfaces like REST API, you can access it through the web, and basically you're on the highway. So this is the power horse can run at petabyte scale and uh, data sets and can analyze it. The problem is how do you bring all this data to something like BigQuery? So cloud healthcare uh, team, myself and Marianne, my colleague who's gonna speak in a second are part of, we are building bridges essentially that allow connecting existing data silos like EHR data, DICOM data, genomics data, and bring this data to BigQuery so that you can start running your SQL queries and build applications on top of it. So this is just to give to the technical folks like how does the interface look like? This is your interface where you can run standard SQL. So whatever SQL you already have, you can repurpose it. Um, a typical workflow, like a, a typical data flow, uh, should be more precise, it looks like this. So you have a cardiology or radiology department. The data flows through a DICOM router. In this case, the router is uh, by life image. It hits the cloud storage. It uh, then pro being pre-processed. So for example, if you want to extract some structured data from the radiology report, you would use something like NLP. Uh, if you want to, for example, de-identify the data for the purposes of research, you can do that. And then you can essentially use any one of our analytic tools. So like BigQuery, CloudML, a bunch of other tools as well. So this is where applications can be built on top of and uh, optimized for the specific use case and for the integration to the clinical workflow, such as shown by Janek before. So this is the, my last slide. I'm gonna leave you with this framework that we uh, compiled based on the use cases we keep hearing from customers. This is one way to begin thinking about your analytic needs in your organization. So one dimension here is operational versus clinical. The other dimension is local versus distributed. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, operational and local could be, for example, a dashboard that tells you how productive is your radiology department or your imaging center. Is my resource, are my resources being allocated well? How are my staffing needs? On the other hand, clinical and distributed could be a population health study that collects data from multiple facilities and tries to focus on patients that I should be prioritizing in reaching out or providing care to. So this is used, please use this as a, as a way to start thinking because oftentimes we hear about customers very interested to leverage the data assets that they have. They wanna get more value. They wanna turn their data assets into decisions, into insights that lead to decisions, that lead into actions. They oftentimes want a starting point. So I suggest using this framework as the beginning, and please come talk to us. So with this, I'd like to pass the mic to my colleague, Marianne Slight, who's gonna talk about her work around clinical data warehouse. Thank you, Harry. So I just have a, a couple of slides. Once your data's on BigQuery, whether it's electronic health record data and or imaging data and or uh, genomic data or other biomedical data, uh, what can you do with it from there? 
So one of the things that you can do is integrate a number of different public data sets that are available on BigQuery into the analysis that you're doing with your own health data from your own institution. And so we have about a uh, 100 different public data sets available on BigQuery right now. Uh, listed here are some of the health ones. Hopefully that's big enough that you can actually read it at the back, but uh, it covers things like terminologies uh, through into uh, also different types of summarized financial data from CMS uh, and uh, other types of genomic data as well. So those can just be integrated directly into the queries uh, against your own electronic health record data and so on, uh, so that you can analyze for other factors that might be influencing trends. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to briefly mention uh, was that in January this year, uh, Google Cloud got invited to observe and attend uh, a critical care datathon by MIT uh, that was running in Paris, uh, deep in the, the bowels of a Parisian hospital. There were about 120 participants, um, roughly split uh, half intensivists, the other half were data scientists, and they were working on, on uh, the MIMIC data set, the MIMIC critical care data set. And in the course of a weekend, it was sort of two very long days, a Saturday and a Sunday in January, um, they came up with uh, these teams of about 10 people, significant new uh, clinical research in the critical care space. And that's now, some of that is now going through the process of being finished off and then, then published. So what we did was we then attended another couple of these datathons, and we've now been working on building out uh, an out-of-the-box offering for datathons, so that that way we can get uh, clinicians together with data scientists in order to work on clinical data sets and use that data for analysis and also for machine learning. And that's really valuable from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, the most important from, from my perspective is that it gives all these geeky data scientists a chance to get their hands really dirty with clinical data. At the one that we uh, supported most recently, uh, not only did we have uh, the MIMIC critical care data set, uh, but we also had some image data sets as well. So that was interesting too. And um, what's, what's, what we provide as part of that datathon in a box offering um, is the uh, ability to store the data, uh, to put it onto BigQuery. We provide the compute power for all of the participants um, at the datathon. Uh, and the datathon organizers and the participants have told us that uh, this is typically saving them like 50% of the time in the datathon, just in terms of ease of access to the data and the tool sets like RStudio uh, or Python and Colab and TensorFlow uh, in actually creating their models and doing the analysis. So next up is London. If you are interested in hosting a healthcare datathon, come up and let us know. Um, now what I'd like to do is introduce Michael Ames, uh, the, um, uh, I've forgotten your title, Michael, I'm sorry about that, but from Health Data Compass. Oh, that's fine, I'll introduce myself. I don't think I need that, but I need this. Hi, good afternoon. It's um, after lunch and you are in really comfortable seats. I have sat in this theater, maybe this very one, watching some Marvel movie when some boring conference was going on and dozed off in the middle of action scenes. So I'm concerned, but I'm going to do my best to keep you engaged for the next uh, 20 minutes and 57 seconds. Um, I am uh, have two roles at the University of Colorado on the Anschutz Medical Campus. First of all, I'm Associate Director for Health Data Compass, which we'll talk about in a minute, and I'm Director of Enterprise Architecture for the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine, uh, which means that I have a variety of responsibilities around our development of infrastructure for healthcare analytics toward advancing biomedical research. I'm so impressed with the other presenters and the work that has been done in the clinical care space and data and interfaces and tools being put in the hands of patients and doctors to help them treat those patients that better, or treat those patients better that day. Our work is a little more behind the scenes because what our objectives are around is how do we help 
scientists, researchers, clinician researchers to develop and prove out new hypotheses that are going to lead to entirely new kinds of care tomorrow. So as you look at some of the things that are unique and distinctive about the systems that we've built, that's one of the things that drives it. And I've got to push the correct button here. It looks like that. Okay. All right, very good. So a little bit about where we sit within the organization. We are a department within the University of Colorado on the Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora within a group called the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine that was recently formed in order to bring together some technology and biology units to drive through better ways to treat patients. And you can see that there are four main divisions that comprise the Center for Personalized Medicine. There is an operating CLIA-compliant molecular diagnostics lab that helps us to do better cancer diagnoses and other diseases. There is a world-class DNA banking and sequencing facility, a high-performance compute cluster that is used for the analysis of data coming from that DNA banking and sequencing facility, and then our organization, Health Data Compass, sits at the bottom, Enterprise Health Data Warehouse, integrating from data from all of these sources and then serving it back out for a wide variety of research purposes. Our funding partners and data sources are University of Colorado Health and Children's, Hol Col Children's Hospital Colorado, two separate independent hospital systems with their headquarters on our campus, um, but not owned or operated by the university in spite of having university in a couple of their names. A uh, little bit of history on us now. Now, I spoke last year at Next, and I'm going to repeat a, a abbreviated version of what those slides were about, because sort of how we got here matters and why we're speaking at a, at a Google conference matters a lot. And I'm going to tell you about that guy in the posted stamp on the top right there in just a second. Um, so first of all, 2013, a big pile of funding is made available to my boss, Michael Kahn, up there on the top right, uh, and, uh, and a grand vision to, to build an enterprise data warehouse. Because it was 2013, 14, and not 2015 or 16, cloud options for a PHI-containing data warehouse were off the table and we didn't even look at them. We decided instead to take our money and align ourselves with a very traditional, very low risk, top to bottom stack, all one color, I won't tell you the color, data warehouse, that out of the box was gonna do everything for us. That was in 2014 and we were really excited and we were building hard and fast. And I just, I wanna take a minute here to, uh, let's see if I can pull this up. I might need my technical support person because what I'm not seeing here is the um, where I can click on this. Oh, can I? Oh, because oh, we're on like a shared screen. Here. Oh, there we go. There we go. She warned me it'd be tricky, and I said it's no problem. I'm a master. But then look at this. All right. So this was a voicemail. Yeah. So first of all, a little bit about Michael Kahn. He's he's one of the country's sort of preeminent clinical research informaticists. He's an MD, PhD, super genius has forgotten more about technology and artificial intelligence than I have ever learned. And uh, he left me this voicemail when we were just getting ready to go live with our first data warehouse. Michael, this is Michael Kahn. I just left a meeting with uh, two consultants that uh, children's brought in to help them rethink through their data warehouse strategy. And I just have to share this quote with you that they said that in their experience, the best organizations are the ones who have failed in their first two or three data warehouse implementations and have used the lessons learned from that to do the next iteration better. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, if that's a criteria for success, we're screwed. So I just thought I would uh, <laughs> share with you that's their perspective. And, uh, uh, I hope, I hope we proved them wrong. <laughs> we didn't. We proved them exactly 100% right. For, for those in the back who might not have heard it, the consultants were saying, oh, yeah, you're not going to get this right until you've failed at least a couple of times. And if they're right, we're screwed. I'm sorry, Michael. We, were, we, went, we went live with uh, a lot of enthusiasm in, uh, in 2015. Let's see, now I'm clicking on the wrong thing. Hold on, I'll get it here. I used the lessons learned from that <laughs> Hang on. to do the next iteration better. I'm going to stand here and just touch this. So early 2015, we launched 
on our monolithic on-premises traditional low-risk data warehouse. It took about six months before we realized that we had made a mistake. For all of the reasons that have drawn you guys here to a cloud conference, you know the pain of dealing with on-premises infrastructure, limited inflexible hardware configurations, running out of storage space, running out of compute capacity, maintaining patches and updates, keeping the network running, 24-7 support and security. We were feeling that and suffering that in a big way in 2015. And again, I won't go to the, to the details for you here, but we undertook uh, a, a major project to migrate ultimately entirely to Google Cloud Platform in 2016. And since then, we have been really busy operating that and delivering on the objectives of our project. And the great news is that even though we had to walk away from a, a we'll just say, a significant investment in our initial system, we have been able to catch up and to be able to deliver on all of our objectives in helping to advance biomedical research at CU uh, after our conversion to GCP. This is what we built. You can see data flowing in on the left from a variety of systems. Everything you were just told about big, almost everything you were just told about BigQuery is true. It has some caveats we can, we can talk about offline if you like. Um, we load data into Google Cloud Platform raw, untransformed from our source hospital systems. It goes into Google BigQuery again, untouched. And then we do all of the transformations, the harmonization, and the normalization of the data within BigQuery. Because honestly, if you're starting with structured data, something in tables, and you want to get to something in tables, and you can express those transforms in SQL, there's nothing faster on the planet, dollar for dollar, than BigQuery. So we get the data into BigQuery as quick as we can, and we do all of our work there. We do a lot of interesting things like cross-linking data. We use probabilistic matching algorithms to make sure that two people with the same name spelled a little bit differently and a mistyped social security number is still linked as the same patient within our data sets. We work to harmonize terminologies across sources so that what we call an apple in one place is called an apple some, somewhere else. And we bring in uh, genomic data from our biobank labs and our clinical molecular testing labs as well as data from external sources, public health agencies, government agencies, et cetera. And my clicker is back to working. That's beautiful. Quick review again. These are actually the slides that we used to sell this to our stakeholders. And what we can report today, 15 months later, is that they came true. These were forward-looking slides at the time. Now they're rear-looking slides. Some of the specific numbers might be a little bit off, but the principles are still absolutely there that in terms of ETL performance end-to-end, -end, starting with getting data out of the source system into the destination system, we see about a 50% improvement over on-premises system, and that includes, by the way, shipping data up over skinny pipes into the cloud. Um, the second is one kind of standout example, that probabilistic patient matching algorithm that I mentioned that helps us ensure that we've got only one record for each person. Our legacy system it was a quarter million dollar application. It took all day to run. We re-implemented that in Google, Google BigQuery. It takes 15 minutes to run and costs us about a dollar a pot. This is just, again, to sort of reaffirm why we're here. And as we look over our sort of five-year TCO, you can see our infrastructure costs over there on the right. I'm not giving you the dollars, but you can see the proportions there dropping dramatically. So what's fun now is we can do some interesting analytics on this data. Here is a not very scientific, but compelling uh, analysis that tries to address a pervasive story in Colorado, which is that Broncos fans are so crazy that if the Broncos are playing and they get injured, the fans get injured, they will wait until after the game before they go to the emergency room. You hear this all the time. So we figured, okay, well, we should have some numbers to prove that. And we did a little analysis here. Now, the way you read, read this thing is each of those rows represents one year of the Super Bowl, 2012 to 2016. On the right side, that's the Sunday after the Super Bowl, so there was no football going on. And you can see three bars for each of those that represent the four hours before, during, and after the game. And you can see as the evening wears on that every year, in a non-football year, the rate of admissions into the emergency department goes down. That's that pattern of big, medium, small, big, medium, small, big, medium, small. You see that same pattern in the blue bars three out of the five years that we looked at. 
in two years it was different. 14 and 16, does anybody know why that's different? Broncos were playing. Broncos were playing. So, you know, we've got to be careful in science not to draw conclusions too much from correlations, but the data here supports the myth that if you're a Broncos fan and you have an emergency department-worthy injury and the Broncos are playing in the Super Bowl, you're just going to put that off for a little while. Pass me another beer and a plate of nachos. I'm going to get through this, and, uh, and I'll, I'll head into the emergency after, or afterward. Most of the work that we're doing is more serious than that. Okay, And what we want to do here is I'm going to take you through a few slides that show some of the real things that we're doing now with the data warehouse that we built, and then a few more slides that show you where we're going. This is a screenshot from a system that we use called Trinetics. Is anyone here involved with Trinetics? Hospital systems or research organizations? I see a few hands. This is a great um, organization that is helping to connect various research sites with pharmaceutical companies, and then also in the process provides a, a beautiful user interface for doing self-service queries on patient data, and our, uh, our researchers can log into this thing themselves, hit a few buttons, and learn a lot about what's going on with the patients at our hospitals to help them to, to do, to kind of go fishing, right? So there's the idea of, I want to do a clinical study, do we actually have the right patient population to do that work on, or I'm seeing some odd pattern in my own patients, and I want to see if there's a broader trend. They can come in here for free, run this and, and do those analyses. And this is uh, populated behind the scenes from a, a, a data mark that we've built in Google BigQuery. That's sort of your getting the toe in the water. There's sort of a progression that happens as researchers move from, here's a hypothesis that I think may, might have legs, to now I want to actually put in and get, get a grant for this. And they need to get a more detailed data extract. And that's where my team's custom data extract service comes into play. We've done about 300 of these, 200 of which have come in just the last year and a half since we moved to Google Cloud Platform. And one of the tools that we provide that, again, is powered in the back end by BigQuery and in the front, in this case by Tableau, is a whole suite of data explorer dashboards that let that researcher independently get in and just start understanding the data that's in the EMR. This doesn't tell them anything about a specific patient, but in this case, we're looking at value sets for medications, and they can look at things like um, frequencies with which this medication is prescribed to certain subsets of patients, and they can see, okay, maybe there's data in the EMR that's going to be of interest to me for my research work. Here's an actual custom data report or data request that we facilitated that starts to speak to the broader message of the Center for Personalized Medicine, which is making sure that when you walk into the hospital, you are getting treatments that are specifically targeted for you based on all the data that we can possibly have about you and our knowledge of how different therapies might affect you because of that background data. In this case, we just wanted to understand of the thousands and thousands of drugs that are prescribed to the hospital every year, there may be only a few hundred for which there is any scientific evidence that there could be a genetic um, sort of switch between whether that drug will work or not. We needed to know where to start. We were able to quickly do this analysis in BigQuery that, that simply summaries and counts and averages and produced out of those thousands the highest value targets for us to start working on for implementing that kind of precision decision support at the bedside. Um, it seems so small because you look at it and you're like, it's a spreadsheet, but when you think of hundreds of millions of rows of data behind there and the effort it would have taken prior to our creating this warehouse for somebody to get access to this, it's kind of an amazing impact. And in fact, uh, we just came from meeting with one of our customer groups at one of the distant uh, uh, hospital sites associated with UC Health, and they talked about that custom data request service and our ability to very quickly get them the data that they need at the time that they need. There was a research study that involved having to go in and do some manual chart review. They said prior to Compass, we would have had to review thousands of charts. Thanks to working with you and your integrated data source, we got that down to about 32. That's a significant time savings, which converts to money savings, both of which convert to reducing friction toward biomedical advances and making people's lives better. Sort of at the end of the path for us, I shouldn't say the end of the path. So the end of the path for um, many of our researchers is ultimately the science that finds itself published in an academic journal. Here's an example of uh, of an abstract that was just accepted to um, 
uh, to ASCO, which is a, an organization, a professional organization for medical oncology. Um, and it seems like a very simple thing, right? So what, what rarely happens in medical research these days is that big breakthrough drug or procedure that's going to save millions of lives that weren't saved before. But sometimes we get something very little. Sometimes you have a doctor who's concerned that in recent years, the number of prostate cancer patients showing up with brain tumors has increased. That's a major source of concern. And word starts to get around in the prostate cancer community. We need to be concerned about the use of these recent drugs because some of these new ones, they seem to be maybe triggering brain metastasis. And we don't want to be treating a fairly benign prostate cancer and creating a much more terrible disease in brain cancer. We haven't fully answered this question yet, but this paper is um, a small step toward, in this case, actually calming those fears a little bit. Because in spite of what the, the qualitative observations were of the doctors who are doing these treatments, when we look at the data, it doesn't show that. It shows that, in fact, we're getting the results that we expect from these new prostate cancer drugs without uh, triggering worse things happening in the brain. It's just as important in medical research to say, here's something not to worry about, as it is to say, here's something to worry about. And in those little incremental ways, we start to make big changes. This actually, going in for publication today, is rooted in the very first custom data request that Health Data Compass ever did for a doctor. And it's one of, again, hundreds that we've helped to provide out to our researching community. So here, here's the thing, though, and this is the warning when you get building a great integrated resource like this, nobody's ever going to be satisfied. As soon as you integrate one data domain, they're going to want another one. And then in our case, we've got the data. It's accessible. It's fast. We've got a great team supporting it. And they're like, OK, now I want to do exciting things with it. And our security and compliance officers are saying, whoa, 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 you can't take all that data and put it on your laptop. That's a terrible idea. They want to know, can I query it? They want to visualize it. They want to compute it. They want to share it with others. And they want to do that really efficiently. So now we fade to black, because we start to shift to things that were not done in the past, but things that we're working on now we're going to do in the future. And that is, we have sort of taken on for ourselves a, a renewed mission, less about data integration and availability, and more about really empowering our partners to be able to do advanced health data analytics. Starts with understanding data scientists who are really unlike anybody else. They're not like programmers. They're definitely not system administrators. They're not doctors. They have unique needs. Their work has bursty requirements. They need 100 CPUs one day and four CPUs the next. In healthcare, they're often working with the most sensitive of data sets, images, um, gobs of PHI. And they can't tell you today what they're going to need tomorrow because it's exploratory work. Peeling off the onions until you, the layers of the onion until you get down and figure out what you need yet next. To solve this problem, the typical approach is, OK, I'm going to just go spend all my grant money on a really fancy computer with a bunch of GPUs in it. But they're only going to use that capacity for a few days or hours or weeks, and then that's wasted money thereafter. Um, getting one independent researcher to be fully HIPAA compliant is almost impossible because of the administrative controls and things that are around. It's difficult for one person to do. And this whole business of, oh, yeah, I was using R today, but I need Python tomorrow and a bunch of packages installed, freaks out the security officers, right? Mm -hmm. So these are problems that we set about to address with a new service that we're calling Eureka. And the intent of this service is to enable researchers to self-provision already HIPAA-compliant virtual machines that are locked down in a way that it is safe to store and work with their PHI in, can be as powerful as they need to be, and uh, will only be charged to them per minute based on the amount of power that they've allocated per Google Cloud platform. We're able to address the cost issue by using GCE VMs, spinning them up as needed at the moment that they're needed to the size and shape that they're needed, shutting them down when they're done. And we're able to address a wide range of cost issues, or excuse me, security issues based on using a variety of Google security controls. It sort of looks like this. You've got your virtual machine in the middle that's like the castle. And when you're in there, this data scientist can do whatever they want. They can install stuff, remove things, and do all kinds of things. But there's a perimeter that doesn't let data in. Maybe even more importantly, doesn't let data out. My security folks would certainly not allow me to publish like a network diagram showing how we do all of this security stuff and create a map for the hackers. 
But you can see there, in order to create this, there's a wide range of Google technologies that come together all at once in order to help us build this. It goes well beyond BigQuery. I'm going to go one minute over. All right. Because we're excited about being able to deploy those virtual machines, and that service is in beta right now. We have people today who are testing that, using it, giving us feedback. We'll go into production in a couple of months. We also have sitting next to us, if you remember this diagram, this high performance compute cluster, which is important because when you're dealing with sequence data, sometimes even like Google's recently announced 160 core, uh, four terabyte RAM virtual machine isn't gonna be enough and you're going to need a cluster. This is a beautiful machine that sits down in the basement of our administrative building. It's well designed and well run and it's gonna come to end of life in a couple of years. If I have my way, we're not going to buy another one. The reason for that is because we figure if we can automatically provision a single VM, maybe we can develop systems for the cloud that will automatically self-provision entire clusters and give people essentially infinite compute power. Um, and the idea is this, that instead of thinking of a cluster as a big fixed resource that is shared between people, or even a big elastic resource that is shared between people, can we use this idea of templating secure analytics environments and at the moment that you need it, click some buttons and that entire, prov uh, that entire cluster is provisioned for you. You no longer have this problem of we overbought, we've got too much cluster, nobody's using it, it's not paying for itself, or we underbought and people are having to wait and they're getting frustrated. We can utilize preemptible VMs to get significant so cost savings on the compute. And um, we can also employ a variety of HPC architectures depending on the use case because we don't have to just settle on one. And there's opportunities out there in addition to traditional mechanisms of doing this with virtual machines. What about Kubernetes? We're looking into this and could we actually deploy the concept of a cluster auto scaling on GKE would involve training our users to understand containers. There's questions out there, but by the time we get there, they might be easy to answer. Um, thanks to some awesome people here. Run through this fast. These are our funding partners, some great technology partners. There are Doug Daniels and Ed Baldiff at Google who've helped us get through some challenges on my team, about half of whom over here and are wonderful. Um, the final things I'll say, 18 months after our Google migration from our on-premises system, no regrets. Any of you guys want to go back? They don't want to go back. Um, when you get data, you'll have demand for analytics, so be ready. You'll need to know how to support that. And finally, when you're moving to the cloud, the biggest benefits are going to come from completely rethinking your architecture, right? Don't say, oh, we've had this great system here on premises. We just need to move a bunch of virtual machines to the cloud, and we're going to be happy. There are going to be some benefits from that. You'll get out of the data center business. But to really get the kind of gains that you saw in some of those slides I saw earlier, kind of flexibility that we're trying to build with Eureka and Eureka 2.0, you might have to completely rethink what you're doing. And I'm done. <laughs>